What's up everybody? Welcome to another video and I hope you're ready to flex those brain muscles. In this video I'm going to talk about proof by cases. So I'm going to show a couple of examples, talk my way through how this proof method works as well as when it's most beneficial. So in the past I made videos on direct proof, proof by contrapositive, proof by contradiction, all that kind of stuff. So I'll link those above if you want to check those out. But let's go and jump right into the first example. So this is the proposition we're going to prove. If n is an integer, then this expression here, n squared plus 3n plus 5, is an odd integer. So we could try to prove this directly by assuming that n is an integer and then trying to show that this expression is odd. But the problem with that, and actually I encourage you to try it, you'll see the problem pretty quickly, is that this assumption that n is an integer doesn't really give us anything we can use to show that this expression is odd, right? Because really what we want to show is that this expression equals 2 times an integer plus 1, right? That's what it means for this to be odd. It's really hard. In fact, I don't even know how to do it by just assuming that n is an integer. So what we can instead do is consider the fact that the set of integers is made up of the set of even integers and odd integers, right? In other words, those two subsets, evens and odds, the union of those is equal to the set of all integers. So that's essentially how proof by cases works, is that if we're trying to show something is true for some set, often we can break that set up into subsets, prove the statement is true for each of those subsets, and as long as the union of all those subsets equals our original set, then the proof is complete. Hopefully that made sense. It'll make maybe a little more sense once we go through this, but we're going to start with case one, assuming n is even, and then go on to case two by assuming n is odd. So case one, n is an even integer. I'm just going to write is even for brevity. So what does that mean? Then n equals two times k where k is an integer, right? That's what it means for an integer to be even. And now essentially what we're doing is a direct proof, right? We're assuming n is even and trying to show that n squared plus 3n plus 5 is odd. So once you kind of figure out what your cases are going to be, from then on it's really just a bunch of different direct proofs, which if you know how to do then this should be pretty comfortable. So what does this mean? Well, this means our expression n squared plus 3n plus 5, we can basically just substitute 2k in there, right? So we get 2k squared plus 3 times 2k plus 5, right? So this is what we're trying to show is odd. So we can just start by first cleaning it up a little, getting rid of the parentheses. So this is 4k squared plus 6k plus 5. And now we need to express this as 2 times an integer plus 1. Let's see if we can do that. And this is really the only tricky part of this proof. And here's how I like to do it. Maybe you have another method that you like better. But I like to write 2 times, leave this blank, and then write a plus 1 out here. And now we just need to figure out what do we need to put inside these parentheses to make sure that this whole expression is equal to this expression. Let's figure it out. So 2 times what gives us 4k squared? Well, that's just 2k squared. Plus, 2 times what gives us 6k? That's 3k. Plus, now here's where we have to be careful, because 2 times what equals 5, that's not exactly what we want, because we have this plus 1 out here, right? So really, we're looking for this to be 4. So 2 times what equals 4? That's 2. And now if you distribute this 2 into everything and then combine this, these two constant terms, you'll get exactly what we have above. And since this expression in the parentheses is in fact an integer, it's a product and sum of integers, right? It's an integer. Therefore, we have completed the proof. This guy right here is an integer. So therefore, we have shown that this is 2 times an integer plus 1. And therefore, this is odd. So maybe put some kind of concluding statement. I'm going to skip that. We'll go straight into case two. All right, so I went ahead and got it started for us. Case two, suppose n is an odd integer, then n equals two times an integer plus one. This time I used m just because I used k in case one. These together make up one big proof. Some people are kind of picky about reusing the same letter in different places. Some people aren't, so I used m just to be safe. Then 
Well, then what? Well, I can replace n here with 2m plus 1, and that's exactly what we get. We get 2m plus 1 squared plus 3 times 2m plus 1 plus 5, and now I need to show that this is equal to 2 times an integer plus 1. So pretty similar to the first case. First, we're going to simplify this a little, get rid of these parentheses, square this out. If you need to write this off to the side and foil it out and do the whole process, totally fine. I'm going to do it pretty quickly in my head. 4m squared, right? 2m times itself, and then we get plus 2m plus 2m. So that's going to give us plus 4m plus 1. So that's that first term there expanded, plus 3 times Right here we can just distribute, very simple, 3 times 2m, that's 6m, plus 3. So these two terms here are this expanded, plus 5 at the end. So now we can combine some like terms here. We only have one m squared term, so we'll just keep that out in front, 4m squared, plus we have 2m terms, so 4m, 6m, that is 10m, and then I think we have three constant terms. Let's see, one, three, and five, so plus nine. And now I'm gonna use the little trick that I used, the same thing I did in case one where I write a two out here. I put a parentheses here, plus one, and I try to figure out what I need to have in this, these parentheses to make sure that this expression is equal to this, right? So two times what gives me four m squared? Well, that's two m squared plus 2 times what gives me 10m, that's 5m, plus, and remember, we need this here to be 8, because we already have this plus 1 out here, accounting for one of these units, essentially, right? So we need this to be 8, so 2 times what equals 8, that's 4, and since this guy here is an integer, we have therefore completed case 2 and completed the whole proof. Right? So we could sort of think of this as we're proving two different conditional statements. Right? Our first case we proved if n is an even integer, then this expression is odd. And in this case we proved if n is an odd integer, then this expression is odd. But remember, integers are either even or odd. Right? The union of those two sets make up all of the integers. So therefore, if n is into any integer, then this expression here is odd. Hopefully that makes sense. We're gonna do one more example right now. All right, so the last example for this video, we're gonna prove something called the triangle inequality. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you've seen it and used it before, but it turns out it's a great candidate to use proof by cases on. So there's a couple of things we need to know before we move forward. One preliminary is that we need to know the definition, the formal definition of absolute value. I'll have that pop up right here on the screen. Hopefully you've seen this before. If not, maybe pause the video, take a look at it, think about it. We're definitely gonna be using this in our proof a lot, okay? Second thing we need to look at is, this is true for all x and y in the set of real numbers. So we're no longer dealing with just integers where we can separate to like even and odd and that sort of thing. In this case, <laughs> in this case, our cases are gonna be things like x is greater than zero and y is greater than zero x is less than zero and y is less than zero. And the reason why we like to break up into those cases is because it tells us whether this x plus y expression is positive or negative and allows us to use the definition of absolute value to finish the proof for each case. It turns out that once we break this up into all the different cases, each case itself is pretty simple, is pretty straightforward. There's just a lot of cases, okay? Last thing I wanna mention is that this is a less than or equal sign, right? meaning either can be true. So that means at any point in any of these cases, if we show that this is equal to this or this is less than this, either of those are sufficient to show the truth of this statement. Hopefully that makes sense. Let's jump right into the first case, which is very trivial. Case one is that x equals zero or y equals zero, and in fact, it's so trivial, I may not even write out a full proof. I think I'll just explain it real quick. This means that either of these can be true. It's an inclusive or, right? So this covers x is zero, y is non-zero, x is non-zero, y is zero, and they're both zero. It covers all those sort of sub-cases, right? So let's start with both zero, because that's the most trivial. If they're both zero, then we have 
0 plus 0, that's 0, equals 0 plus 0, right? We get 0 equals 0, that's true. Okay, what if x is not 0 and y is 0? Well, then we get the absolute value of x plus 0. That's just the absolute value of x, which is equal to the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of 0. That's just 0. It goes away. And the same thing happens when you switch them and you suppose x is 0 and y is non-zero. So I'm going to write trivial here. If you really want to spend time thinking about that and writing it out, you are free to. Probably don't want to write this on your exam or homework. You probably want to write it out even though it is trivial. But that's what I'm going to write. We're going to move on to case 2, which is that x is greater than 0 and y is greater than 0. Okay, so what this case tells us by making this assumption, it tells us that x plus y is greater than zero, right? So that means that then the absolute value of x plus y equals, well, that's just equal to x plus y, right? If we add two positive numbers, the result is positive. So x plus y is positive. We take the absolute value of a positive number. We just get the number x plus y. Right? x is positive, so x is equal to the absolute value of x. y is positive, so y is equal to the absolute value of y. Therefore, we've shown that this expression equals this expression, which suffices to show the truth of the original triangle inequality. So hopefully this is making sense so far. Let's go ahead and jump to case 3, which is x is less than 0 and y is less than 0, right? Now we're assuming they're both negative, which means what? Well, that means that x plus y is going to be less than 0, right? Which means that using our definition, the formal definition for absolute value tells us that, well, this absolute value of x plus y is going to be equal to negative x plus y which is equal to what? Let's see, do I have enough room here? I think I do. I'm gonna write it this way. Negative x plus negative y, right? Because it turns out that if x is less than zero, then negative x equals absolute value of x by definition, right? So this is equal to absolute value of x, and the same goes for negative y. Since y is less than 0, negative y equals absolute value of y. So everything so far has really just been by definition, right? Pretty straightforward. And we've covered a lot of cases. Either x is 0 or y is 0, we covered that. Both greater than 0, both less than 0. So the only two cases we have left are x is greater than 0, y is less than 0. And x is less than 0, y is greater than 0, but it turns out we actually only need to really prove one of those cases, and I'll explain why toward the end, but let's go ahead and finish this up. All right, case 4. Suppose x is greater than 0 and y is less than 0. What do these assumptions tell us about x plus y? Well, they don't really tell us anything as far as whether x plus y is positive, negative, 0, and we really need that information to deal with this absolute value using the definition. So we're kind of stuck unless we introduce something called subcases, which are essentially just cases within a case. Pfft, mind blown, right? So our first subcase we can introduce is, well, let's say subcase, and I'm going to call it 4.1 to indicate that it's a subcase of case 4, and it's the first subcase, but the notation doesn't matter too much. But we're going to say, well, let's suppose x plus y is greater than or equal to 0. And then our next one will be, let's suppose x plus y is less than 0. And those together will cover all the possibilities for x plus y. So we're good to go there. So now we can use this extra assumption. This really helps us because now what we have is, well, then the absolute value of x plus y is equal to x plus y. And now is when we have to use a little, or we don't have to. The way I finish the proof is by using a little clever trick. And what I can say is, x is a real number, and we're adding a negative real number, right? So if we take a number and add a negative, that's definitely less than taking that number and subtracting a negative, right? And the reason why this helps us is because if we just rewrite this very slightly as x plus negative y, then we
And what we have is, by the definition of absolute value, this equals absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y, which is exactly what we wanted to show, that the absolute value of x plus y is less than absolute value of x plus absolute value of y. So in case you were wondering when that less than comes in, these are the cases where it comes in, where we have one being positive, one being negative, we get that less than here. So hopefully that little trick makes sense. If you need to pause the video and think about it, you're welcome to do that. Now let's move on to the next subcase. Subcase 4.2, which we're going to assume that x plus y is less than zero. So using all these cases and subcases, it may seem like all this extra work, but once we put these into place, you see how easy the proofs turn out? That's why proof by cases is often a good option because it really simplifies a large complicated proof into a bunch of little simple cases, right? That's just my perspective at least. So x plus y is less than zero. What does this tell us about the absolute value of x plus y? Well, this tells us the absolute value of x plus y is equal to negative x plus y by definition, which is equal to negative x minus y now is when we're going to use another little clever trick. This time we're going to look at x. Remember, x is positive. So if we take the negative of a positive number, that's definitely less than the positive of the positive number, right? Which means that negative x minus y is definitely less than positive x minus y. Picture the number line. That's what I do at least. Visualize the number line and it will make a little bit more sense. But because this is true, we can now continue in the same way we did from here on, right? Which is say that, well, this equals x plus negative y, which by definition of absolute value, since y is less than zero, equals absolute value of x plus absolute value of y. So we've shown that the absolute value of x plus y is less than the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y which is sufficient to prove this triangle inequality. And now we're almost done. I mentioned that we have a fifth case, which is that y is greater than zero and x is less than zero. But here's where we can employ something called without loss of generality. Without loss of generality. This is how I've always written it, W-L-O-G. And it essentially means that we can prove this one case because the other case is almost identical, right? I don't really have a formal definition for this term, but that's essentially when it's used, is when the other case, which is y greater than zero and x less than zero, is essentially an identical proof. And if you think about it, it really is, because if we put y here and x here and replace all of the x's with y's and all of the y's with x's, that's the proof. Right? So you could rewrite it all out, or you could just say without loss of generality, suppose x is greater than zero and y is less than zero. Save yourself some time. I think most, if not all, math professors would see that in this context and be like, oh yeah, that's legit. So it is a little bit subjective, but I'm going to use it here, and I think most math professors would agree that it's fine to use on this case. So hopefully this video made sense. Sorry it was a bit longer than I expected. More videos to come. If you have questions, leave them below. Any comments, thank you for the support. Keep flexing those brain muscles, and I'll see you all later.